Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bridget Shearer. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Belmont, and um, I'm pleased to welcome you all to our March Belmont Talks event. Um, just a um, quick overview of what Belmont Talks is all about. You've all heard of TED Talks, and um, thanks to our volunteer, volunteer coordinator, Susan Rendina, um, we have modified TED Talks to um, bring it to Belmont and make a Belmont Talk series. And so since January, I think, of last year, we have been hosting a talk series every month um, on all different types of topics. And one of our most popular um, is about um, gardening. And so we're excited to be hosting this evening, um, this evening's topic. Uh, next month on April 13th, we're going to be um, offering a um, a presentation about the dangers of fentanyl. As you know, that's a big problem in, in every community in the United States right now, and that's going to be um, hosted by the Belmont Police Department. And on May 11th, uh, we're going to have Toastmasters come and talk to us about giving presentations and, um, and being comfortable with public speaking. So um, Again, I want to thank you all for, for joining us on this rainy evening, whether you're in person or on Zoom. And thank you to the Belmont Library for making this space available to us. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to um, Jonathan Prop, who's going to be talking about spring and summer vegetable gardening. Welcome, everybody. I apologize for not being there in person in the library, but um, given the weather, I didn't feel great about driving up there tonight and so fortunately Bridget and Susan were flexible and willing to let me present via Zoom so I'm down here in Menlo Park. Um, we're going to talk about spring and summer vegetable gardening and I was thinking today um, given how cold it's been and how rainy it is it's it's hard to kind of wrap your mind around the concept of summer gardening right now uh, but the fact is, it really is time um, to start uh, planning out your spring and summer vegetable garden and to actually start planting stuff. So that's what we'll uh, cover today. Um, before I start, just a couple of things. The, if you're not familiar with the Master Gardeners, um, we are a volunteer branch of UC Cooperative Extension, uh, which is the Agricultural Extension Service of, of the University of California. Um, there's a Master Gardeners branch in pretty much every county in California. The, the chapter, the San Mateo, San Francisco chapter has been around since I think 2006, and I joined in 2008. Okay, let's get started. I'm gonna go for an hour here and we'll leave a half hour for Q&A. So if you do have questions, just put them in the chat window. We're gonna have people monitoring the chat stream and they're gonna compile the questions. And then at the very end, we'll start digging into the questions. Okay, well, um, let's get started. So here's the agenda. For tonight, we'll talk about soil because soil is so important to growing good vegetables. What, when, and where to plant, which is probably what you're most interested in. We'll talk about propagating seeds, transplanting. Uh, then we'll we'll talk about some things about caring for your plants as they're growing and maturing and fruiting. And then just a little bit at the end about things like irrigation, pest control. There's a lot of slides here, and I'm not going to have time to go through them all, really, but you all will have access to the presentation. It went out in the invitation today as a PDF file, and if, if you don't have it, then just give your email address to Susan in the library, and um, she'll make sure that you can get the presentation. That way, there's a lot of detail on some of the slides that you we may not get to in the next hour. Okay, so soil. This is a, a, a great view of what soil is. And I, I think for a lot of people, it's kind of eye-opening to see what is soil made of. 
And, you know, so for example, it's 25% air, right? And, and 25% water, mineral particles, 45%, and then the remaining is organic matter, which, which you can see broken out at, at the end. There's been a lot of research about soil in the last 20 years or, or so, and I think we understand so much better what is going on down there. Basically, what it is is that soil is alive. There are microorganisms and organisms who live in the soil. We've learned a lot about fungi and bacteria, specifically mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which have a symbiotic relationship with plants. And they free up nutrients from the soil to the plant in exchange for some of the sugars that the plant creates through photosynthesis. So there's an amazing web of life in the soil and the reason that matters is because if you want healthy plants and tasty vegetables, you need to cultivate good soil. And a lot of our native soils here in, in the Bay Area and on the peninsula are not very good. Um, they've been, you know, sort of the product of tectonic plates mashing together and so uh, we have a lot of clay in, in our soils. They're fairly alkaline. Um, and so you need to cultivate good soil. And as you build soil over the years, you want to make sure that you don't dig it up and kill some of the microorganisms. Now, you know, not all of us have the luxury of being able to garden in the natural soil. Um, so you can have potting soil in containers, uh, for example, and, and we'll address that later. But the first thing you want to think about in the springtime is feeding your soil. So the best way to do that is to add some compost. Compost is putting organic matter into the soil. So if you remember that chart, some um, 10 per five percent of the soil is organic matter, right? It's decomposed uh, plants and manure and things like that. Um, you want to be adding compost to your soil in the spring. So. Um, the best thing to do is, is to get a good uh, two to three inches of compost, um, put it, apply it to your bed, and um, then mix it into the top few inches of, of the soil. A, a lot of times people will ask, uh, we get free compost from Recology, and Various people have looked at that soil, at that compost, and sometimes there's some uh, not great stuff that comes through in that compost and doesn't fully break down. So if if you're serious and you want to have an organic vegetable garden, I would recommend that you buy an organic compost. Uh, you can get it at a garden store down here in the South Peninsula, there, there are some places like Web Ranch where you can pick up organic compost, et cetera. So what do you do in the spring? Add compost, mix it into your soil. Um, if you need more nutrients in the soil, then add some fertilizer, okay? Um, and we'll talk about when you might wanna do that. Mix it into the top of your soil. Once you've planted and you have um, seedlings, then you can start mulching the soil. And mulch is a, is a layer on top of your soil, which reduces evaporation and reduces weed growth. And it can reduce evaporation by as much as 50%. So particularly in hot summers here, that can be really important. 
if you planted a cover crop, this is a, a photograph of fava beans, which are a commonly used cover crop. Crimson clover is, is another good one. Then at this point in the season, it's grown up reasonably high. It's too late to plant a cover crop now. Um, if you do a cover crop for next year, you want it in the, in the garden in October. That way it can sprout and start to grow, grow slowly through the winter. It'll pick up as the days get longer at this time of the year. And cover cropping is a very natural way to add nutrients to the soil. So fava beans and crimson clover that I mentioned um, vetch, oats, buckwheat, plants like that, a lot of them uh, add nitrogen to the soil. So they're, and nitrogen is one of the key nutrients that plants need. So a lot of the cover crops are basically fixing nitrogen into the soil. And that's why we do cover crops. They also keep the soil from getting compacted because you have roots growing down through there and that helps keep the air and the water in, in the soil. If you have grown a cover crop, there's absolutely no need to pull the plants out with the roots. That'll disturb the microorganisms in there. So you can just cut them off right at ground level and then chop them up really fine they'll be nice green mulch for your garden. Um, the roots will die without any photosynthesis going on above them. So that's an easy thing to do. Um, if, if you wanna turn them under, by all means, you, you can do so. As I said, once you cut the plants down, the, the roots will, will just die and decay and they'll become more organic matter in the soil. Now, do you need to add fertilizer or not? Well, to some extent, it depends on what you grew in that. I'm assuming that this is a garden bed, maybe a raised bed where you grew vegetables last year. If you did grow vegetables last year, it depends on what you had in there. So plants are characterized as um, heavy feeders, light feeders, and what we call soil neutrals. Heavy feeders are plants that use a lot of nutrients from the soil. These are going to be your typical warm weather vegetables like tomatoes, cucumber squash, eggplant, etc. Corn is, is notorious for using up a lot of nutrients. So if you were growing these last year, then you've depleted a lot of the nutrients in the soil. And unless you cover cropped, you're gonna to need to add some nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, N, P, and K, the main elements of fertilizer into your soil. Now, other plants are light feeders. So you can see a lot of the, um, a lot of the root crops here, um, mustard greens, um, Swiss chard, so those don't take a lot of nutrients from the soil. If that's what you had in the bed, you may not need to add fertilizer in the spring. Now, soil neutrals are um, the legumes, beans and peas. And like the cover crops that I mentioned, beans and peas actually add nitrogen to the soil. It's, it's, what, it's called nitrogen fixing. If you pull up your bean plant and look at the root, it's got these little white nodules on it. And, and those are um, nitrogen fixing bacteria. So they're taking nitrogen and feeding it down into the soil. Once those beans and peas start seeding and creating pods, then that process reverses and it takes the nitrogen out of the soil to feed the, the, the pods. So that's why we call them soil neutrals. They put, so, they put um, nitrogen in, but then they're gonna pull it out later. Um, and the reason when you cover crop using say fava beans 
the reason you cut you cut them down is because you don't want them to to pod and form beams because they're going to reverse that nitrogen process. So if you do have a cover crop of fava beans, you want to let them flower and then chop them down. All right. Um, one more thing on what to put in the garden, and that is this idea of crop rotation. So a lot of uh, soil-borne diseases will build up in a vegetable bed if you keep planting the same family of vegetables over and over again. So this photograph here is something called verticillium wilt, and you can see it's a tomato plant, and you can see the leaves are turning brown and dying. There are two main types of wilt in tomatoes, fusarium wilt and verticillium wilt. Once they're in your soil, they're really hard to get out and they last there for years and it'll just kill any tomatoes that you grow there. So the way to avoid that is by not planting crops from the same family in successive years. So for example, if you're looking at tomatoes, they're in the nightshade family. You, you don't want, you want to try to avoid, whoops, sorry. You want to try to avoid planting these crops in the same place year after year. Similar for, for the other crops, like the cruciferous vegetables here, your, your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, etc. cetera. Um, so you want to rotate your crops. Now that said, we don't all have the luxury to rotate crops. For example, in my yard, I really only have like a couple of areas which get enough heat and sunlight to grow the eggplants and tomatoes and peppers. So if, if you're in that situation, then what are your choices? Well, you can plant disease resistant varieties. So if, for example, with tomatoes, they'll have an F1 or V1 notification on the seed pack. F1 being fusarium wilt, V1 being verticillium wilt. And that means that these are hybrid seeds that have been bred to be resistant to those varieties. So if that's something you can try to do if you don't have the option to, to rotate crops. All right, so um, when to plant, I'm sure this is what everyone was interested in. This is a planning calendar that we have on the Master Gardener website. If, if you go to the website of the San Mateo, San Francisco County Master Gardeners, and, and you go into gardening resources, you'll see something called planting calendars. And these were put together by um, one of our best gardeners, Carol O'Donnell, um, over a decade ago. And she created three calendars, what we call foggy, sunny, and hot. And that's because we have so many microclimates within San Francisco and San Mateo counties. Um, we have the whole fog belt, which is over on the coast um, and much of San Francisco. Um, the Southern Peninsula side of San Mateo County is the hot zone, Redwood City, Menlo Park, Atherton, Woodside, for example. Um, and then, Sort of the in-between area is, is what we call the sunny area. So I would say, you know, San Mateo, um, San Mateo, San Carlos. I, I chose this one for this presentation because I think Belmont kind of falls into the sunny um, area. I mean, you guys aren't really in the fog belt, but you, you're definitely not in the banana belt of, of San Mateo County. So if you go to the website, you can you can access all three there. Uh, we even have them in in Spanish 
um, and I and I think Mandarin. So the way to read this is, you know, for a particular month, this is what you can plant, and then S refers to seed, and T refers to transplant. If you look at this, you'll see a few things. First of all, you can plant all the root crops from seed at this point. Um, carrots, carrots, turnips, beets, um, et, et cetera. Um, they don't need particularly warm soil. Um, I'll show you a slide in a second that gives you um, sort of optimum soil temperatures for germination. You, you can basically plant any of your root crops right now. The other thing you can plant from seed right now is a lot of your greens. So um, for example, spinach will do just fine, lettuce will do just fine, um, collards, Swiss chard, um, et cetera. So the greens generally can tolerate kind of cool soil conditions as well and you, you can plant them. Um, if you're thinking, of, you, you can also plant your cruciferous vegetables now, your uh, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, et cetera, but you, you'll really wanna plant them from transplants, which means uh, you've either gotta go buy them in a garden store or you'll have had to have started them six weeks ago indoors. Um, and then you, the one thing you'll see you you will see is missing from March is the warm weather vegetables. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, cucumbers, beans, it's just not warm enough for them yet, particularly this year because it's been so cold. Um, so the soil is not warm enough. The nighttime temperatures are not warm enough. Um, those you're going to find really in late April and May. Um, you know, when I started as a master gardener, the perceived wisdom was that you put your tomatoes in the ground on May 1st. And, you know, as our climate's been changing and warming, you know, that date has really moved into the second half of April, I think. And um, I'll talk at the end about our spring seedling sale, which is April 15th. And that's a perfect time for getting your warm weather seedlings. You buy them in mid-April, you give them a week to what we call harden off, and that is get used to being outside. And, and then they go in the ground in late April. Now, the question of whether you plant from seed or from transplants. Um, so first of all, all the root crops don't transplant well. So you must sow directly from seed. The, um, the greens mostly, and then um, some of the cucur bits down here and the legumes, you can do either. Um, in my experience, you know, greens are pretty tender and 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 f fussy to transplant. I mean, you think about transplanting a a small lettuce seedling. It's it's pretty tender and small, and it's kind of easy to to break it. Um, all those greens will will do just fine from seed. And as I said, they'll germinate in pretty cool temperatures. So these are, you can do these from um, transplants if you want to get an early start, for example, but they'll do just fine from seed. Um, peas and beans, again, if you want to get an early start, you can, you can start them inside, but they really do quite well. Um, so directly in your soil. Um, similarly for squash and cucumbers, they germinate quite well outdoors. It's just you need much warmer soil temperature for, for these guys down here 
than you have right now. Um, and then, you know, in terms of some of these vegetables here, it's generally, um, it's generally perceived that it's better to do them as transplants than direct seeding. Um, and so th that's what most of us do. Now, obviously, someone's got to start it somewhere <laughs> as a seed, but, um, you know, that's typically something that's going to be done indoors or in a greenhouse and then eventually taken outside. That said, I have a an Italian American neighbor here who seeds all her tomatoes directly outdoors in the spring in like 50 degree soil. And she says it works every year and she learned it from her mother. So I think there's exceptions to every rule and you know, you probably could grow these um, directly from seed outdoors if you wanted to, but um, most people are going to do them as transplants. Now, this is this is some useful information about um, you know the kind of seed temperatures you need to germinate. So you know the the minimums are pretty low. You can see here, and like here, you know, here are tomatoes. You know, you can put them in as low as fifty degrees, um, but you can see the optimum range here. And, um, you know, it's a lot higher, particularly, for, I mean, look, look at this for squash. The optimum range is really um, quite high. Eggplant as well. Um, and, and, and here's why that matters. Um, this is days to germinate at different soil temperatures. So you could put your tomatoes into 50 degree soil and um, they'll take a month and a half to germinate okay um whereas if if you know you plant your tomatoes in 68 degree soil they'll take a week and and this is why for things that you want to direct seed outside like like your 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 beans uh like say your beans or or your cucumbers or um I'm not seeing squash here um you're really going to want to see your soil temperature get up around 65 um, degrees or so before you put them in the soil. Um, conversely, I mean, look at lettuce. I mean, lettuce is going to germinate in a week in 50 degree soil. So, you know, there's no reason you can't go out there tomorrow um, and plant lettuce, except that you'll get rain dumped on you. Um, so the one of the best tools you can get yourself as a gardener is a soil thermometer. It costs like eight bucks and it's just a, a little probe you stick into the soil and that way you know when it's a good time to plant or not. And I went out there last week and I stuck it down in my soil and it was like 50 degrees. And if you think about it, you know, the nights have been around 40 and the days have been barely 55. So um, it's not surprising that my soil is 50 degrees. And that's pretty cool for this time of year. So get yourself a soil thermometer and that way you can monitor when it's a good time to start uh, sowing directly in, 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 in the beds. Okay. Now, a lot of times people ask, is it better to plant seeds versus seedlings? Well, as we already talked about, there are some vegetables that you uh, really want to direct seed and not try to transplant. So for those, you're always going to want to do seeds. But where you have a choice, you know, what are the, what are the pros and cons? Well, seeds are going to be cheaper, right? You'll pay, you know, $3 for a seed pack. Um, and, you know, that can have, you know, dozens of seeds in it. Whereas you'll pay like 4 or $5 for a six pack of, of transplants, like, you know, down in this photo here. Um, so it's certainly cheaper to do seeds. 
another reason to do seeds is that there are way more varieties available. If the, 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 the nurseries are stocking the most popular brands, uh, varieties of vegetable. And if you want something that's a little bit different, you're not going to find it there, right? And that means you got to start from seed. So for example, um, if I look at um, snap beans um, and I go to the nursery, like they're always Blue Lake and Kentucky Wonder. And those just aren't my favorite varieties of beans. There are other varieties that I like better. So I'll buy the seed packets for those because you can get those, whereas you can't get the seedlings for those. So that's a big reason um, to, to get um, to start from seeds rather than seedlings, particularly if you're interested in growing like heirloom varieties. There are a lot of uh, seed companies now like Baker Creek Seeds that um, sell some really wonderful heirloom uh, variety of vegetables. Um, now, the downside with seeds is it requires advanced planning, right? Um, it's 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 going to be four to six weeks or so before those seeds turn into something you can transplant. So, um, you know, it, it, if you didn't do the advanced planning and you're like, I want Swiss chard plants tomorrow, then you're going to go out and get seedlings from from the garden store. OK, but if you can plan it out ahead of time, you have the space and <clears throat> tools to start things indoors, then, you know, working from seeds is a great option. Let's talk a little bit about uh, types of seeds. So um, hybrid seeds are um, commercially bred seeds. They're not naturally occurring varieties. Uh, they can be bred for disease resistance, like we talked about with tomatoes or yield or, or whatever. If you try to save those seeds, you're not going to get the same variety the next year because it's a mix of a couple of other varieties. You'll get something, but it, it's not going to be the same variety. Open pollinated seeds, are these are naturally occurring seeds. Um, if you save those, you'll get the same variety the next year. Heirlooms, you often hear a lot about heirlooms. They're simply an open pollinated variety that's got some sort of a long pedigree. Um, and, and a lot of us that grow heirlooms do it because <clears throat> you, you don't find a lot of them in the grocery stores. Like, for example, with tomatoes, um, a lot of the heirloom tomatoes have great flavor, but they don't travel well. So they're not going to be in the safe ways, um, for example. So so that's why a lot of us will grow heirlooms because if if you want those varieties, that's how you're going to get them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on this. So just one thing about nursery starts. Um, avoid really sort of tall, leggy plants. Um, any yellowing is a sign that... Um, that plant long ago used up the nutrients in the soil, and it's not going to be a particularly healthy plant. Um, <clears throat> double stems, you want to try to avoid. You, you really want to try to find a sturdy stem. <clears throat> and then dark green means that it's getting enough nitrogen, particularly, and other nutrients out of the soil. And then when I say right size for pot, um, a good rule of thumb is that the root structure is a half to two thirds of the length of the stem. Okay, so if you look at the stem on this really tall tomato here or this tall basil plant, you can easily figure out <clears throat> that the roots have sort of bottomed out here. 
in which case they're going to start going anywhere they can. They're going to wrap around themselves and you'll never get a good root structure out of that plant. So it's a little counterintuitive. You know, you go to the nursery and you think, I want to buy the biggest thing for my money. But oftentimes buying that oversized pot is going to give you an unhealthy plant. So buy something that's right size for the pot. Okay, starting seeds indoors. Um, <clears throat> this is a way to, you know, get a jump start on the season. So um, if if you're you know planning to put your warm season crops in the ground in late April, then um, you should have planted them indoors by now. It's it's not by any means too late to start now. You could you could go out and start this next week and you'd be fine. Um, but a lot of us will have started in February. Uh, here, uh, this is my setup here. Um, <clears throat> I've appropriated my son's bedroom. You can see his world map here over the desk, and um, I just I just have a tray here. There's a heating mat under that, and that is to we talked about soil temperatures for germination. A heating mat is going to give you a warmer soil temperature while you're germinating the seeds. Um, and then I've got a grow light <clears throat> over it. And, and, and we'll talk about um, grow lights because um, once those seeds have germinated, you're going to need to give them light. And oftentimes, whatever's coming through the windows is not enough. So you'll want to provide them. Um, some light. Um, okay, so um, to germinate indoors, first of all, you want to clean your trays, pots, whatever you're using with a 10% bleach solution. Um, I reuse, you know, when I buy vegetables at the nursery that transplants, um, they'll come in four inch pots. I save all my four inch pots and reuse them. But just in case there were some diseases in there, I'll wash all the pots in water and a 10% bleach solution. I'll just take a big bucket, fill it with water, put some bleach in there, and then I'll just take all the pots and stir them around in there, get everything off them, um, and then rinse, rinse them out. Um, make sure they have holes on the bottom so that water can drain out. A again, you're going to put this in a in a seed tray, so the seed tray holds all the water. Um, but the pots themselves, you want holes in the bottom, and then um, the water will get wicked up from underneath by by the roots. Um, key thing to know about is that seed starting medium, um, often called planting mix is not the same as potting soil. It's a special kind of mix that's lighter in weight. So it's easier for seeds to germinate and pop through. And it doesn't generally have any nutrients in it. So it's really something that's just designed for germination. And then you're gonna need to either add nutrients or what we call up pot those seedlings to uh, potting soil, which is going to have more body and, and nutrients in them. Um, make sure you keep them moist. Um, if you look at my setup here, um, this is a plastic cover here. When I, when I start this and I, and I, I put seeds in, in here and I set it down on the heating mat, um, and and this I'll have the soil moist when I start. I cover it with this um, plastic that's over here, and that keeps the heat and humidity there. And after about a week, everything's sprouted. I just take the plastic cover off. <clears throat> but then you need to make sure you keep adding water in there. And the best way to water it is is from is not from the top but from the bottom, okay? <clears throat> so water only from below. And I turn the, uh, the heating mat off after everything's germinated. Key point, 
label your pots. <laughs> I've made this mistake. It's like you got, I got 18 different pots in that tray. And if I don't label them, I'm like, oh, okay, what was this? And is this a tomato? And what variety of tomato, et cetera. So it may seem kind of mundane, but label your pots. <clears throat> um, we've been doing a lot of work in the Master Gardeners with soil blocking. Um, it's a technique that's been around for a long time, but um, it's 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 actually it's a really cool technique. It's um, this is there are lots of different size and type soil blockers, but it's um, not a fancy device. It, and and this is something that'll create um, essentially four two by two inch blocks at one time and. So with soil blocking, um, basically this thing serves as soil and pot at the same time. Um, so you just plant in this thing. And the great thing about the soil blocker is when you pull the handle down, um, it creates the block and it creates a little divot in the top, which is where you drop the seed. Um, so it's kind of an all-in-one, easy-as-you-go kind of thing. And then you don't need to up pot at all. These, um, this is a, 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 it's, it's really more of a potting soil than a planting mix, um, and it has some nutrients in it. And you, you can make your own soil mix, or you can do it out of potting soil. Um, and then this whole block just goes straight in the garden as, as a transplant. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice way to go, and we're doing more and more of it. Okay, once your seeds have germinated, as I said, you need a light source, um, about six to 12 inches from top of the plants. Um, the arrangement that I have that I showed before, um, the, the, the light is hanging on a chain. And I, so I can adjust the chain as the seedlings get taller, I can, I can move the light up. Now, Here's the thing, an ordinary fluorescent light doesn't really do the trick. Um, vegetables uh, absorb the ends of the light spectrum, the blue end and the red end, okay? Um, which is why it looks green, because that's what it reflects back, which is in the middle. <clears throat> so you need both blue and red light um, for full spectrum. Um, the light the light I have there is is what they call a grow light. Um, it was like forty dollars, and it has basically it's all LEDs. It's not fluorescence. It's got a red tube, a blue tube, and a white tube. Um, and if if you're serious about this, it's probably worth doing the investment in in a grow light. Otherwise, I I would say you could do sort of a low budget option of um, a bluish fluorescent, which is what they call cool white, and a reddish fluorescent, which is what they call warm white. Um, here's a good trick. You want to provide some air circulation. So take a fan and put it on lowest speed and just blow it across the seedlings. It helps them develop thicker, sturdier stems. Plants need to sleep at night just like we do. So basically mimic the daylight hours. Turn on the grow light in the morning, turn it off at night. Um, trim to one plant per pod or per soil block. Rather than trying to tease out the different stems from each other, you can just trim it off with scissors. And like I said, the, the root will die in there. And just make sure they stay moist and, and water from below. Okay, thinning, whether, you know, once you've planted outside in the bed, uh, so particularly if you've direct seeded outside and you've, you've seeded something like lettuce or greens or whatever, you're going to have way too many uh, plants out there uh, for you to use. And, and you need to give plants adequate space to let them grow up. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get, you know, very stunted plants. Um, this is particularly true with your root crops. Um, like if you've ever 
you know, had a couple of carrots growing right next to each other, then you, you've seen that you don't get full-size carrots there because they're competing with each other. So you have to give plants adequate spacing um, for, for when they grow up. And j just remember, you know, when you're doing things like, when you're thinning something like greens, say mustard greens or lettuce or um, Swiss chard or whatever, those things are perfectly edible. You know, they're what people call microgreens and sell for a lot of money. And and they're really tender and, and good. So whenever I, I thin my, um, my, uh, my greens, um, I'll just snap the leaves off and save those and then throw those into salads. But you definitely have to thin and thinning is really boring and yet it's, it's something you have to do. How much sun do your vegetables need? Well, um, your leaf or root vegetables can get by in six hours a day just fine, but your fruiting vegetables, and um, you know those will include your um, squash, cucumbers, peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, corn, et cetera, um, they, they need as much sunlight as you can give them and a minimum of eight hours a day. Um, so all those warm weather vegetables, they just want as much sun and, and as much heat as you, as you can give them. So when you get your warm weather vegetables and you're going to plant them, um, first of all, plant deeply, um, to establish root growth. And when I say deep, I mean deep, and it's like, it's hard to believe, but you know, a third to a half of the stem gets planted underground. Okay, so think about a tomato that you've got that, you know, might be this tall, you're going to put half of that um, under the soil, and that helps it develop a, a deep root system. Um, follow the spacing guidelines. I love this photo. I found it online. Um, if you've ever grown a sun gold tomato, which is the most wonderful cherry tomato, it's a what we call a vigorous grower, <laughs> meaning that it'll it'll take over your garden if you let it go. Um, so, you know, this thing started at some point as this high, right? Um, and so when they give you spacing requirements on seed packs, they're there for a reason. Um, follow them. Like I said, soil temperature needs to be 55 degrees, and then they're all heavy feeders. So you're gonna need to fertilize them every, every two to four weeks. Um, now, companion planting, there's been a lot of, you know, there's a lot of folk tales about companion planting, what goes well, what doesn't go well. Um, that only in the last few years have there has there been some good research on this and you know what is myth and what is fact. Um, but some basic things is your cucurbits, which are your cucumbers and your squash and melons, need pollinators. They have separate male and female flowers, and they need somebody to take the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. Okay, so having some flowers around that can attract pollinators is, is a good thing for the cucurbits. Um, your, your nightshade family, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, um, they have male and female in the same flower. So they don't need pollinators. Although there has been some interesting research done that bumblebees help the the male and female parts of the tomato flower to to mingle that the buzzing of of bumblebees somehow the vibration helps the pollination process which is just fascinating um tomatoes onions and basil seem to go well together aside from the fact that they taste great together i don't know why this is but it seems to happen um <clears throat> lettuce carrots and radishes do seem to go well together 
I, I like to sort of plant them in alternative rows. Um, carrots and radishes, of course, are deep rooted. Lettuce is shallow rooted. So you can you can intersperse them fairly closely together. Um, you know, carrots, lettuce, radishes, etc. Et Corn beans and squash is known as the three sisters. Um, the indigenous peoples have grown these in combination for years. Um, in the Santa Clara Master Gardeners Demonstration Garden down in San Jose, they have a whole Three Sisters demonstration garden. Um, and, you know, they, they, there's good scientific reasons why these work. Um, corn and squash are heavy feeders. Beans provide nitrogen to the soil. So the beans essentially feed the corn and squash. The corn provides a stalk for the beans to grow up. So you don't need a trellis. And then if you think about it, the corn is really vertical. And then the squash is very horizontal and spreads out between the stems of the corn. So the squash helps shade the soil in between the rows of corn. So that's a, a well-researched and well-proven combination um, that, that works well together. You know, in the Bay Area, we all have small yards pretty much. So you know, what are some hacks you can do to make the most out of small spaces? So you can choose climbing varieties. Um, this is a kind of squash that I love. It's called trompetta, um, which means trumpet in Italian. And you can see it kind of looks like, a you know, an old medieval trumpet here. It's a, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful and it's a vining squash. So you can, you know, put it on a trellis or, um, or you know, put it up a, a tomato cage or something like that. Um, I like to grow a lot of stuff vertically because I don't have a lot of space horizontally. So pole beans instead of uh, bush beans, for example, and I'll just trellis them up. Um, you know, you can, something like winter squash sprawls all over the place, right? So you could plant it right at the corner of your raised bed and then let the winter squash just kind of sprawl outside of your bed. Um, if you have shade loving plants like lettuce, you can plant them beneath taller plants and um, keep your tallest plants at the end of the bed so they don't block the sun. Um, <clears throat> one, one of... Uh, our best master gardener sent me a photograph last summer of um, how he he did the reverse. Um, he planted his taller crops where they blocked the sunlight to some of his other crops. And he was showing the, the difference in growth between the ones that were shaded and the ones that weren't. And, um, it, 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 he was he was very embarrassed about doing it, but it was it was a great demonstration of the fact that you want to uh, have your shorter plants closer to the side that's getting the sun and not block the sun. Okay, a little bit about containers. If you want to use containers for vegetables, um, for your large plants like tomatoes or squash. Um, use at least a five gallon container and, and that means 18 inches deep. Um, the next slide is taken from the book Golden Gate Gardening and um, it actually gives some recommendations on, on how deep um, you need your containers. But, um, you know, when I buy fruit trees from the nursery, they'll come in like five gallon, um, sometimes even larger pots I will save those pots and again, clean them with a bleach solution and use them as, as pots for, um, for tomatoes. Um, oops, sorry. 
um, so it, you can actually reuse the potting soil in your containers. Um, this is a big if, if you're maintaining nutrients and soil structure. So you can't just take the same soil and replant in it the next year. You got it because all the nutrients are taken out of that potting soil. So you'll want to add some fertilizer and compost to that soil, just like you do to your, your garden beds. But if you do something like that, you, you can probably get two to three years out of, um, out of potting soil. Now, just one thing to bear in mind with containers is that um, you'll need to water more frequently and um, you'll need to add nutrients more frequently because it's a smaller space and the water and the nutrients are gonna get absorbed more quickly. Um, ceramic pots especially can get pretty hot in, in hot weather. So um, and when we do have a heat wave, you need to check your plants and containers. And if they're starting to be droopy, um, then you got to water them. Um, I put mulch into my containers and that keeps uh, it from evaporating. Um, Try not to water from above and get it on the leaves. Try you, you know, I, the phrase I love is water the soil, not the plant, right? When the plant can't absorb the water through its leaves or the stem, okay? The plant can only get the water through its roots. So when you water vegetables, you, you want to water the soil and not the plants. So the, the, you know, if you do have drip irrigation, um, run a drip line into the pot. I have a lot of my containers um, sort of next to my raised beds. And so I'll just take a drip line and run it from the drip line that's in my raised bed and, and put it into the, uh, the container. Um, harvesting. Um, takes a lot of time, plan for it. Bear in mind that, um, you know, some vegetables um, need, to, need to be harvested to keep producing. So, you know, we've all had the experience of the zucchini that was hiding under a leaf and we didn't see it. And when we found it, it was the size of a baseball bat. Well, if the plant is feeding that zucchini, then it's not feeding other zucchini, okay? So you wanna harvest things like squash and beans when they're at the appropriate size for harvesting because that in turn means that new, uh, new fruits will be created. And then um, do successive plantings of, of, you know, things like this to extend the season. So for example, you know, with my beans, I'll kind of plant beans every few weeks or so. And that way, you know, I'll have, have sort of a continual supply of beans. Similarly, you know, with some of the greens, um, if you just keep sowing them every few weeks or so, that way you can sort of have lettuce going on all through the season. Um, so just, it takes a lot of planning because, you know, the, the seed that you put in there today is gonna germinate in a week or two, and then it's gonna take a couple more weeks to get to any sort of decent sort of size. So you always wanna be thinking about six weeks ahead of time. Here's a better photo here. You can see I've got some, I've got some mustard greens and such already growing, and then I've created a a, a row because I'm going to plant Swiss chard in between. Okay, so you know the Swiss chard will get planted in in between the mustard greens, and then um, as the mustard greens are sort of getting late in their life, then the chard is is going to be. Uh, emerging. Okay, going to wrap up very quickly on, on a couple of topics, and then we'll stop for questions. 
irrigation, water the soil, not the plant. For that reason, drip irrigation is the best way to go. Um, it's not cheap. Uh, it's not easy. It tends to break but it is far and away the best way to deliver water directly to the soil. If you take a hand sprayer and you go out there in the afternoon and you spray your vegetable garden from above, half of that water is going straight up into the atmosphere, okay? And so if you have drip irrigation, you're generally gonna to wanna to run it before sunrise um, when evaporation is low, and that water is going to go down to the roots of the plants where it's it's needed. Um, water needs will change over the life cycle of a plant. When you're germinating, you need to keep the soil moist. Um, when plants are fruiting, they generally have a need for a little bit more water. And then after they've fruited, you, you can cut back on the water. But you got to look at things like, you know, is my soil clay or sandy? How much water does it retain? Am I mulching? Are we having a heat wave, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to spend time on this. You can look at this yourself. But um, basically, it's a way of trying to figure out how much water you need to uh, give to your vegetables. And unfortunately, if you go online, it's someplace like um, UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, and, and you look at irrigating vegetables, they talk in, in terms of this. It's like one to two inches per week, okay? Because that's how the commercial growers think about water use. But it's like, what does that mean <laughs> for me, right? Um, so I've done some of the math here to help you help you figure it out. And basically what it means is that for me, using a four by eight bed, which is a fairly standard size, um, and I've got drip irrigation with sort of standard emitters, I basically need to run it for two hours a week. Okay. But, you know, you just need to do the math for your own situation. Okay, uh, finally, pests. Um, love them, hate them. Um, I think we get more questions about pests than anything else as master gardeners. And um, so UCANR promotes something we call integrated pest management. And the whole idea is, you know, don't go out there and just dump a bunch of chemicals on, on, on your, your vegetables. Not good for the soil, not good for you, not good for the environment and the other animals out there. Um, so you know, they have sort of this five step process monitoring for pests, like, you know, look for the signs of pest damage, okay? Um, and then figure out what you have. There are some great resources online. If you go to UCANR, to their integrated pest management website. They'll have like photographs that'll show you, oh, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, this kind of a beetle or it's it's this kind of, of a moth or something like that. Um, also, it's a great use for the master gardeners. You can email photos of the damage to our helpline and we'll get back to you, you know, within a day or so, um, telling you what your problem is. So once you figure out what it is, then you start to do things like habitat modification. So if it's snails, you know, do, you know, can you get rid of areas where there might be snail nests nearby or rats nests nearby or whatever? Um, and then you go to population control. So for snails, you can go out at night and hand pick them. So that it's the best proven method um, to reduce snail populations. Or if it's rats or mice, then you put out traps and so forth, right? And then, you know, kind of the last step is biological controls, which is, you know, follow nature and do what nature does to, you know, to control nature. So most of these pests have predators, 
right? So you use those predators to eliminate the pests. You know, most of us are having kind of a rat and squirrel explosion on the peninsula these days. And in large part, it's because the natural predators of those animals have disappeared, right? So, you know, so how do you, how can we use nature um, to control pests? Um, a couple of things that, that I use, um, th these are called floating row covers. It's a, it's a thin woven material. Um, it lets in more than 95% of the sunlight. It's porous um, to rain. And, and so for my low crops, particularly my greens, um, I'll cover them in these floating row covers. Um, and you can look online for, you know, lots of good techniques for, um, for, you know, putting these over your beds. Um, but you can see, obviously, this is going to keep out four-legged uh, pests like squirrels and rats and mice, um, but it's also going to keep out a lot of insect pests. So it's going to keep out your aphids and your beet leaf miners for your squat, for your Swiss chard and stuff like that. Now, obviously, if you have a tall plant like a tomato, it's not going to work, right? So th this only works for, for where you have low crops. Um, and then this is something else I use. This is an electric fence. Um, this is my attempt at squirrel pest control. And basically it delivers a kind of mild charge um, to any squash who wants to go in and, and steal a tomato. Um, okay, not going to spend time on composting. We're going to stop for, for questions. So just a reminder, um, here are the flyers for the Spring Garden Market, Saturday, April 15th, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., San Mateo County Event Center in San Mateo. Uh, if there, we have a lot of varieties of, you know, things like tomatoes that grow well in the fog belt. Um, if there are specific varieties you're interested in at the market, I would say get there early because um, a lot of the tomatoes are going to be gone by 11 o'clock. And that is it. Um, just want to do a big shout out to the library and Parks and Rec for um, doing such a great job of organizing and for uh, doing this last minute pivot um, today. So um, with that, um, let's, just, let's see if we have any questions. Well, so far, Jonathan, your your presentation was so complete. We actually don't have any online questions, although I do have a question for you, if you don't mind, sure. which might interest other people too. When you're using drip irrigation and you've got your little seedlings, do you have to put the seedling right next to the drip hole or will the water kind of spread underground even though you can't see it happening? That's a great question. I, I originally felt that it was better to be near the drip hole. And then the more I've read about this, the more I've learned that the water just travels in the soil. Now, it depends on your soil, right? If you have, you know, a real clay-like soil that doesn't have a lot of good air pockets in it, then maybe the water's not traveling as well. But if you've got a good soil with decent air pockets, then the water is probably going to travel in there. Thank you. I've, I've always wondered. Do we have any questions from the people um, who are at the library? We do. I'm just wondering how we get this PowerPoint. Oh, the PowerPoint came, well, well, I can get it to you if you give me your email, but if you signed up, it came in your email today. It was a okay. PDF. Yeah, so you should have it. Another question? Uh, I'd like to ask uh, how John deals with uh, pruning tomatoes. <laughs> does he not? And if he does, what's his process? Did you hear okay. that question? Yeah. Uh, okay, pruning tomatoes. 
Now that wasn't a master gardener asking that question, was it? Just a, a plant in the audience? Not at all. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, um, Susan, it might help if you repeat questions, but I think what I heard was pruning tomatoes. Yes. Do you prune them? And yeah. And how? And how? how okay. How is as important as if you do them? Okay. So if you want to get two master gardeners to argue, you you you, you talk about pruning tomatoes. Um, so tomatoes, there um, there are these things called suckers, right? So you've got a main stem. Okay. So first of all, two different types of tomatoes: determinate and indeterminate. And when you buy your tomatoes, make sure you know which type you're getting. We have both types in the Master Gardener seedling sale. There's a lot more indeterminate tomatoes than determinate. Determinate tomatoes, basically, you're going to get all your fruit pretty much within a short window of time. So it pretty much fruits at once. Okay. Indeterminates they they keep growing and they keep fruiting over time. Um, and so determinate tomatoes tend to have sort of a, a, a more branching um, to them. And you tend to just let them go. Um, for indeterminate tomatoes, and most of the varieties you're going to see are indeterminate, um, they have this thing called suckers. And so you've got your main tomato stem going up and then you've got a leaf going off at like 90 degrees, okay? And then there's, there's something that starts coming out. It, it's like a bud that comes out at 45 degrees between the two, okay? And well, it's, and it turns into a stem, right? You've seen these on tomatoes. That thing is called a sucker, okay? If you let that thing develop, it'll become a whole new stem, okay? Um, and and it'll, it'll continue and then the leaves will grow off that and, and flowers will come off that and maybe there'll be even more suckers coming off of that. Um, some gardeners believe that you have to just pinch off all those suckers, okay? Um, you know, right when they form, just pinch them off. Others say, no, just let them develop. Um, you know, what I've learned, it, I tend to be uh, variety specific. So for example, sun gold, I showed you a sun gold, you get a lot of suckers. And if you don't pinch some or a lot of those off, you're going to get this just very, very bushy uh, plant and it's important that um, the plant get enough sunlight into it. So, and, and it's a fine line because you want enough sunlight getting into it for the fruit to grow, but you don't want so much that they're gonna get sunburned. Um, so I tend to kind of leave a few suckers on, on, on my bigger tomatoes um, and, and, and let them sort of fill out a, a little bit. Um, some people do believe in pruning them back. I, I don't with most, but some like the sun golds, I mean, they just keep going and going and going and they'll get 12 feet high, which is kind of high to har harvest. So with something like the sun golds, I will cut some of the stems off and then it'll of course grow more lateral stems. Um, so it's it's very much sort of variety specific, I think. Um, if it's starting to get too tall, then just cut it off and let it grow more laterally. Um, give it a little bit of, of uh, bushiness, but not too much bushiness. Okay, thanks. Any other questions in the room? One, one another question, go ahead. On cover crops? On cover crops, yeah. Okay, you said when you have cover crops, you cut them off yeah. at the ground. Cut them off at the ground. Leave the roots in. And leave the roots Is in. Is that only cover crops or like a tomato plant? 
would you cut that off the ground and leave the roots of the tomato plant in there? Can you cut like a tomato plant off at the ground and leave the roots in? Absolutely. You could do it. You can do it with anything. Like oh. the roots will just decay. But the, the thing I want to point out is if there's any possibility that that plant harbored a disease, then you don't want to do that. You want to get that plant completely out of there. But yet, I mean, in any plant, and so, you know, when I started vegetable gardening, I was an assiduous turn, turn the soil over kind of guy. In fact, I was doing what they call the double digging technique, which is like a lot of digging and going deep and stuff like that. And then, you know, th there's this whole no-till movement that started in, in the last 20 years, which basically says, don't turn the soil over at all. Don't disturb the microorganisms in the soil. And I I've really come around more to that now. So um, I, I'm just not going to disturb the roots. I'm going to cut them off right at soil level and, and let them decay in there. You're just letting nature be nature. Is that even true with like weeds that you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a couple online questions now, if that's all right, Jonathan. Sure. Beth, Beth would like to know the best way to tackle aphids. Um, so, um, I have a, one of my beds is close to a plum tree, which gets an aphid infestation every spring. And, and, and so, um, so the, I, I put the floating row cover on that. So the floating row cover will keep out the aphids. Um, if you get aphids on leaves, um, so obviously lady beetles, which is the uh, which is the proper term for ladybugs, they eat aphids. So like if you have lady beetles, love them and and hopefully they'll eat your aphids. You can buy lady beetles at nurseries, and I've just heard so many stories about people who buy the lady beetles from the nursery. They come home, they open it up, the lady beetles fly away and never come back. So, it, it, but here's the thing. Um, a good solid spray of water works wonders on aphids. Just, you, you know, spray the leaves, but on the underside, okay? The, the aphids are going to be on the underside of the leaves because that's where they get access to, um, to the nutrients in, in the leaf and the water that they're interested in. So you got to spray the underside of them. Um, if you have like a hose sprayer, a lot of them will have like a horizontal spray setting um, and you use that and you just you just spray up at the leaves. And if you do that every day, every couple of days, it'll generally take care of your aphids. That's great. Thank you. And Steve would like to know what types of fertilizers you recommend. Okay. Um, again, you know, if you want to get a couple of gardeners arguing, you can start talking about organic versus inorganic fertilizers. Um, so, you know, so fertilizer, there's generally three numbers, N, nitrogen, P, phosphorus, K, potassium, three main nutrients, okay? And for an inorganic fertilizer, you're gonna like like you know say um, what is it called um, Miracle Grow or something like that. Um, you'll see numbers like twenty 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 something like that. Pretty high numbers. Um, an organic fertilizer, you're gonna get numbers like four four four. Okay, much lower numbers. So organic fertilizers. Um, they work more slowly. Inorganic fertilizers, basically all those nutrients go straight to the roots and your plant just like, it, it's like you're putting your plant on speed, okay? And that's great, but then, you know, a few days later, you've lost the benefit of that. Organic fertilizers, 
it, you know, just as we say, water the soil, not the plants, feed the soil, not the plant, okay? So when you're applying fertilizer, what you're doing is you're building up nutrients in the soil, or what you want to do is build up nutrients in the soil rather than going directly to the plant. So that's why a lot of us will do an organic fertilizer is because it, it helps build up your soil, which is really what you want to do to give yourself healthy vegetables. Um, a lot of the organic fertilizers will also have things like mycorrhizal fungi in them and, and, and will try to boost some of the microorganisms in the soil. So I recommend an or, or organic fertilizer. They're, you know, they're more expensive for sure, um, but I think you'll get better results. Well, thanks. We're going to have to wrap it up because the library is going to be closing. <laughs> so thank you so much for this. This was great. Um, thank you both. And we, we, we did send out the PDF. If you need, and some people have it, if you do need to get, get that and you didn't sign up, you can uh, send a mail to volunteer coord, C-O-O-R-D, at um, belmont.gov. I'm the volunteer coordinator, volunteer, volunteer coordinator, and I'll get you that PDF. And here are the other, if you want to say something. Um, but yeah, here are the other resources that you can have, you have access to. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, in, in last minute, Sure. Um, this is this is information on the helpline here. Um, in, in, so it's a great, it's all free um, information and, and it's a great way to get um, answers to your gardening questions. Okay, thank you very much. This was great. I think, yay. <laughs> thanks for thanks for doing this and taking your time to do this here and ever and all the other places you do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you guys. Have a good evening. Stay you dry. You have a good evening too. Bye.